fantastic. So I'm, I'm thankful to be uh, a part of this. Now, I, I'm not going to be as good as your normal pastor. It's okay. Uh, anything that I mess up, he's got the rest of his career to fix, okay? So I'm just going to, I'm going to just let it fly, okay? But I am, I do live in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I have four kids. My wife, Becky, and I, we have four kids together. Um, and, and like your pastor, my children are much better looking than I am. And it's just the benefit of marrying well. And uh, which is not really a diss on you. It's more of like a compliment to your children and your beautiful wife. Yeah, um, that didn't, that sounded much meaner than I intended it to. I apologize. <laughs> I'm just saying we're, 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 we're good looking. God, never mind, I'm going to stop. Um, I, and so my kids are 17, 15, 13, and 11. Those are their ages, not their names. And they pray for me every time that I'm going out. So the, the night before I, I came here to be with you guys, we prayed before bed and they prayed for me and they always pray an extra dose when they know I'm coming to Canada because I'm from Texas. Now I love you guys, but my blood is thin. It is very thin. Uh, growing up in a warm climate, climate plus sweet tea does something strange to the body. I cannot tolerate cold at all. And it seems like every time I get invited to come to Canada, it's in the winter, which is six months for most of your country. And it's, it's horrible. And I don't own enough clothes to stay warm. I have like five layers on and my thickest socks and my warmest boots. And and, uh, and so I'm so, so thankful that I woke up here this morning. I thought that it was going to be typical Canada, and it's not. You guys are sitting on a secret, and you not, you're not letting the rest of the world, because this is not what we think of when we hear Canada, right? It's not what we, if we did, we would all move here. We would. So I'm keeping it off of Facebook. I'm not going to tell them. But I did send my kids a picture of your lake and your beautiful mountains this morning. And my um, youngest daughter asked, she said, can we move there? And I said, not right now. And she goes, does Justin Bieber live anywhere near there? And so then I prayed for her. Um, you know, you can raise your kids only so well that they make bad choices. So um, Justin Bieber fan over here. Do we need to have an intervention? No? Okay, fantastic. <laughs> anyway, so it's good to be with you guys. So I, I believe that God is Southern. Um, they, they, they were not sure I said what I just said. I'll, I'll repeat it. I do believe that God is Southern. I can prove it. In Exodus chapter 16, God's children are making a long road trip from slavery in Egypt to freedom in the promised land. And on that long journey, God's kids get a little hungry and a lot whiny, and so God pulls over the minivan, and he has a talk with his children through the babysitter Moses, and he says these words to his children. In Exodus 16, I will rain down bread from heaven for you, and each day you are to go out and gather enough bread for that day. This is a test to see if you'll obey my instruction. God being the good father that he is, he kept his promise. The next day, his children woke up. They looked out in the front yard, and to their amazement were millions of delicious pieces of this light, flaky, sweet bread. It was so good that they named it manna, which in Hebrew means, what is it? actually what it means. I'm not making that up. It means, what is it? And in the evening, God fed his children quail. So in the morning, manna. In the evening, quail. Or what people from my neck of the woods would call biscuits and chicken. This is obviously God is Southern. You're not still not going with me on that. Okay. All right, right, right. So we can at least find some common ground. We can at least agree on this, that God is good. Amen? And he shares his goodness with us. But the problem with receiving the best from God is that it can bring out the worst in us. God, when he served breakfast and he served dinner, he also served a law, not just any law, the very first law that he gave to the nation of Israel as they set out to form a new kind of society the world had never seen before. See, God had a plan for his people. He took them out of slavery and he moved them to a new neighborhood called the Promised Land. It's in Canaan. Now, they're not there yet. It's 40 years down the, down the road. Now, how many of you, you've moved, right? It's a terrible experience. Moving 
is a horrible experience. I can't stand it, all right? I moved two years ago, and I still have boxes in my garage. I don't even want to open them. I don't know what's in it. I don't miss it. I just want to give it away. If I haven't used it in two years, I don't need it. I hate moving. Can you imagine moving for 40 years? That's quite a journey. And on this journey, at the end of this journey, they're going to be in a new neighborhood God has picked out for them. He's picked out a cul-de-sac for them where they are surrounded by neighbors who don't know God at all. They're surrounded by nations that don't know anything about God. And when they arrive, he wants them to be the kind of people that will live in such a way together that all the neighbors will look at them and see what God is like. He wants the neighboring nations to look at them and how they live together and to say, wow, God is real. Their God is good. I could trust a God like that but they're not that kind of people yet. Right now, they're still pretty self-absorbed, whiny brats in the wilderness. And so he begins to father them, to mother them, to give them instruction along the way. 40 years of parenting them so that someday they'll be the kind of people that show the world how good God is and that he can be trusted. Now, on this journey, he begins to give them laws. The first laws we usually think about are the Ten Commandments. But that's not the first. The very first law that God gave his people so they could become a people that shows the world he's good, the very first law he gave was about breakfast. It's in Exodus 16. I will rain down bread from heaven for you, and each day you are to go out and gather enough bread for that day. Are you serious about following my instruction? Take only your daily bread. Take only your daily bread. Do you want to be a nation, he says, that can show the nations that I'm good and can be trusted? Then take only your daily bread. Let's just start with that. Do you want to be the kind of church that shows the valley that God is good and can be trusted? Then start here. Take your daily bread. Do you want to be a family that shows your neighborhood that God is good and can be trusted? Take your daily bread. If you're a note taker, we have three points this morning. The very first one is God's mission. The second one is God's command. The third one is God's method. God's mission, God's command, God's method. First, God's mission. God's mission is to show the nations that he's good and trustworthy. And he's told us how to do that, to start with taking your daily bread. If you do that, then everyone will get to taste and see that God is good and can be trusted. Now, God told them exactly how much daily bread was. He told them to take one omer, which is a little over two and a half liters, take one omer of food for every person who lives in your house. One omer, that's it. That's your daily bread. Now they went out and they began to collect. Every morning they would collect their daily bread for everyone in their home and everything was great. Everyone got to taste and see that God was good and could be trusted. But then one day somebody took more than their daily bread. We don't know why they did it. And maybe they were an overachiever, an early riser, one of those to-do list keepers. I'm married to one of those, I understand. And that person just got up before everyone. They were the first ones to the breakfast buffet. And they worked harder than anyone else. I mean, they did the responsible thing. They did the right thing. And maybe they just looked around and they, and they thought, look, I deserve, I've earned a little more bread. I mean, I've done it all right. I've done it all first. I did it all best. I've earned it. Maybe it wasn't that at all. Maybe they collected their daily bread, their one omer for everyone in their house. And when they got through collecting, they looked up and they could see, gosh, there are millions of pieces left. No one's going to miss a little more. This isn't going to hurt anybody. We don't know why they did it, but we know they did. They took more than they needed. And they put it in the pockets of their toga, and they went back into their tent to store it in their retire. I'm sorry, their uh, refrigerator, in case God ever stopped being good, in case God ever stopped being faithful. And this broke God's heart. And God, like a good parent, saw this as a teachable moment. 
And he turned their leftovers, their extra, into maggots. And it began to stink, and it no longer satisfied. And isn't this our story? It sure is mine. I know from personal experience that we can fill our houses, we can fill our bank accounts, we can fill our social media with likes and comments and shares, we can fill our walls with diplomas, we can fill our calendars with busyness, we can fill and fill and fill, but we'll never be filled because we were made by God to be satisfied by only Him. Only a God who really is good and can be trusted can satisfy. And everything else is just maggots and stink. Now, I don't know about you, but if I come to breakfast tomorrow morning um, and I go to pour that healthy cereal that my wife buys for me, and instead of pouring it, it wriggles. You know, and, and when it hits the bowl, it doesn't smell like raisin or bran. And if that happens to me tomorrow morning, I'm going to be on my face, like right there by the refrigerator, crying out to God, I am so sorry. What have I done? Everything is filled with maggots and stink. Please give me a new start. And you know what? God's such a good father that he does. He gave them a second chance. And it says that from that time on, God's people obeyed the first law. And they took only their daily bread, just what they needed. And it ends so beautifully, Exodus 16, it says that he who gathered much, because he had much family, did not have too much. And he who gathered little, because he had little family, did not have too little. But everyone had as much as they needed. But here's the best part. Everyone got to taste the goodness of God and experience that he is trustworthy. He will care for us. God's mission is to show all the nations, all the nations, just how good and trustworthy he is. Our second point is that God gives us a command. In Galatians, what's happening, a bit of context here, is that the, the gospel, the good news that God so loved the world, he sent his one and only son. So whoever believes in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. That news has not gone out to the nations yet. Only the Jews know it. And so the church gathers together in the city of Jerusalem, and they're going to send the apostle Paul out to be the very first one to preach that good news to Gentiles, to non-Jews. It's such an important moment in the history of the church that the pillars of the church, the three leaders, James, Peter, and John, they lay their hands on Paul, they pray for him, and they send him out those back doors of that church out into the world to preach the gospel to people who have never heard it before. This is an important moment. It's such an important mission. And as he leaves, they give him one piece of instruction. Now think about that if that was you. If this morning your pastor called you to the front, hey, we believe you've been called by God, empowered by the Holy Spirit to go out into the world. We found a group of people who've never heard the name Jesus and you get to go tell them. But before you go, we have one piece of final instruction to give. What would it be? What would it be? In Galatians 2, here's the last piece of instruction he was given. In Galatians 2, Galatians 2 says this. <laughs> they gave us only one instruction to remember the poor. The very thing I had been eager to do all along. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor. And I was eager to do that already. Eager, this word in English comes from a Greek word that means a fervent desire that cannot be stopped or quenched. A passion that cannot be put out. He says, you want me to remember the poor? Oh, you couldn't stop me from remembering the poor. 
You couldn't stop me. I'm overjoyed and excited and eager to do this thing. I'm going to go out to the world. I'm going to preach that God came in flesh and was crucified for the sins of the world, was resurrected to kick death in the face. I can't wait to tell them that, but that's not all I'm going to do. I'm going to remember the poor as I go. And you can't stop me. How do we become eager? How do we get that? Because look, if we're all honest, there aren't many of us eager to remember the poor. So how do we get there? It helps to understand who the poor were to Paul. The poor, we believe, were the Christians right there in that church in Jerusalem. We believe that about 80% of Christians living in Jerusalem at this time were living in abject poverty. Now, the Bible defines poverty, physical poverty, differently than our economists and politicians do today. The Bible defines poverty very simply. If you don't have bread to eat today, you are poor, according to Scripture. If you have bread to eat today, you are solidly middle class. You're doing great. If you have bread to eat today and you have bread in the pantry for tomorrow, you're rich. That's the economics of Scripture. And we believe that 80%, around 80% of Christians living in Jerusalem, 80% of the Christians in the room that day when Paul was sent out, 80% of them, they didn't have food to eat that day. Paul would have looked down in that room as they said, Paul, remember the poor? And they were saying, Paul, remember us. And he would look out in that room and he would see a listless toddler, stoic from starvation. See a baby sitting, a skeleton, a little frame sitting on a mother's lap, her breast depleted by malnutrition, nothing left to give. See a father with tears still wet on his cheeks from burying his little ones too soon. And the poor aren't some problem far away to Paul. They're people that he'd worshiped with week after week. They weren't some statistics, some number that politicians and economists and theologians talk about. They weren't numbers. They were neighbors and they had names. He knew them. He was eager to remember them because they weren't out there somewhere. They had already crept their way into his heart. He had a relationship with them. These were neighbors with names and faces, people he loved, people he knew, and he was eager to remember. But if we live insulated lives, we live insulated lives where we maybe occasionally drive through those neighborhoods. Or maybe we say a prayer for a missionary who lives in one of those places. But we don't know a name. We don't have a relationship. There's no real connection. If we live insulated lives, we will live lives that lack eagerness. But when we get connected to someone in need, you can't stop us from remembering them. God's mission, God's mission is to prove to all the nations that he's good and trustworthy. God's command to all of us is to remember the poor. And there's no better way to remember than to relate, to have a real connection. Our third and final point is that God has a method. God has a mission. God has a command. Now God has a method. What is God's method for showing the nations he's good and trustworthy, for remembering the poor? How is that supposed to happen? Well, the Apostle Paul, when he was sent out from that church in Jerusalem that day, he went and he preached the gospel. And man, tens of thousands of people came to faith in Jesus Christ. And they began to gather as churches in places like Thessalonica and Antioch and Rome and Corinth. And he would disciple them. Sometimes he would come and visit and teach them. Some other times he would write letters to them. But he was helping them along in their faith. And he wrote a letter, for instance, to the church in Corinth. Christians gathered there. That's 1 Corinthians. And in that letter, one of the things he tells them about are the, the poor living in Jerusalem. Now, he, 
they fly a different flag, they have a different face, a different shade of skin, they may speak a different language, but they're still our brothers and sisters. And so he says, hey, they have an, a need over there in Jerusalem. They are hungry. They are desperate. And so I'm excited to tell you that you get to take care of them, that you get to give to meet their need. And so he outlines a plan, God's method. And he says, I want you to create some leftovers in your life. Right now, you might be spending everything that you've got on yourself, but I want you to create some leftovers. And then when you have that leftovers, I'm going to come collect them. And we're going to take your leftover biscuits, and we're going to pass those to the church in Jerusalem so that through the church in Jerusalem, the needs of the poor can be met. So God's people are going to give through God's church so that God alone gets the glory. God's people giving through God's church so that God alone gets the glory. That's God's method. That's God's method. So first they had to create some leftovers. And that was hard for some people. I mean, some people, they needed to move from a larger house to a smaller one, maybe sell some lands that they don't really use. Maybe they had to go from a smartphone to a dumb phone or give up Tim Hortons. I mean, they made some real sacrifices. But they made these sacrifices so they'd have some leftover biscuits to pass. Then Paul, sometime later, writes them a second letter, 2 Corinthians. And he says, I'm coming now to collect those leftovers. Thank you for creating them. It's such a joy that we get to give now. I'm going to come and I'm going to collect your offering. And I'm going to bring it to the church in Jerusalem so that through the church in Jerusalem, the needs of the poor can be met and our God can be glorified. But before I come, I've got a word to say about that offering. And that's what we're going to look at now. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 13, 14, and 15. Here's what he tells us about the offering. And it helps us this morning as well. First, he says, our desire in collecting this offering is not that others might be relieved while you would be hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. Hard-pressed is the English translation of a Greek word, thalipsis. Thalipsis is almost always rendered in English as the word tribulation. So in your New Testament, when you see the word tribulation, it's thalipsis. It's this word. It's the, the picture of someone trapped under an enormous weight, like a boulder. And the life is being squeezed out of them, and it's going to end them. And he says, that's not what giving should be. It shouldn't be that way at all. Now, he's telling us two things about giving. The first, he's saying something about our attitude in giving. And you don't need much help on that. The second thing he's tell, telling us about is our, the amount we can give. So the first thing is the attitude. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because, I, look, I've never, I'm in 100, 100 cities a year for 13, no, 18 years. And I've never been in a church where they say it's time for the offering and people shout <laughs> happy things, right? <laughs> That never happens. So look, just a few verses later in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul's going to tell us how much God loves cheerful givers like you. He's talking about you, and I just got to say, you're a unicorn. Like, this does not exist. I don't know if it's the donut wall. I don't know what it is. But something has gotten into you, and it's beautiful. And I'm going to leave here bragging about you because this is freaky stuff. We're going to take our, in the first service that happened, it, it startled me, you know? Like, hey, we're going to collect our offering, and we're like, woo! We're like, what? Do we get to take from the offering? Like, what is, what is going on? So you've got the right attitude. Way to go. You don't look at the offering as a tribulation. It's not a burden. It's a blessing. I mean, man, it might be, it's such a gift because when you get to give, you get to for just a second think, do I have anything to give? And what you're amazed to realize is, wow, I have a lot I can give. I mean, I got to choose what clothes I wore this morning. I didn't just have one outfit. I got to drive. To, I probably chose which car to drive to church. I've got more than one. 
I mean, I have more than I actually needed today. So when they said, we're going to take the offering, I get to kind of take stock of my life for a second and go, wow, God really has been incredibly generous with me. And that turns it from a burden into a blessing. So he's saying, your attitude should not be to treat the offering like a tribulation. It's a treat. The second thing he's telling us is about the amount that we get to give in this offering. Now, follow me here. <laughs> I love Canada. I'm up here in the colder parts about once a month, right? I hope I get to come back here more. <laughs> I didn't know you existed. I'm going to definitely insist that I come here again. I want to go back to the island part. But I'm usually in godforsaken places like Winnipeg and London and <laughs> Toronto, Manitoba. Um, you know, you're so, you are the sweetest, kindest, gentlest, most passive aggressive people on the planet. I love you. Yesterday on the flight, and I'm not making this up. Yesterday on the flight, I was sandwiched into a middle seat, which I don't really mind. But the guy next to me, I had to kind of step over him because I needed to use the restroom. It was a long flight. So I said, excuse me, sir, may I, may I get up to use the restroom? And he said, oh, sorry. Uh, and I said, why, why are you apologizing? I, you're not doing anything wrong. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm having, to step, I'm having to inconvenience you. And then he said he was sorry for saying sorry. <laughs> Like, that's a new level of niceness, guys. New. I thought I was being very polite, but apparently not. And so, because you're so nice, I'm sure you don't have this problem, but where I come from, the average American who attends church regularly, which is just once a month, right? So a person who attends church once a month in America, 80% of those people don't give any of their income away to anyone. The 20% who do give, give two, on average, 2.1% of disposable income away. That means after they've taken care of everything they need, they give 2.1% of the rest away. I'm sure you don't have that problem. I bet everybody in this church gives and gives generously because you're nice Canadians. So in America, whenever we preach about giving, the goal of the typical sermon on giving in my country is to get people to give a minimum. The real goal is to get people who said, I surrender all to just surrender something. Like that's the goal. We're trying to set a minimum. Now, I'm sure you don't have that problem here. Paul didn't have that problem at all. Paul's not trying to set a minimum. Paul's setting a maximum. You see, he's talking to people who are so convinced that God is real and good and trustworthy. People who are so eager to share that good news with the poor and the outcast and the desperate. These people are so joyful at the opportunity to give that before the offering plates are passed, Paul says, don't give too much. Don't give to the point that it's a tribulation. I know you are very eager to put a roof over the heads of that other family's kids, but look, don't leave your family out in the cold. Don't sell your house and live in a box to give them a home. I know you're desperate. You're so eager to give people who are hungry something to eat today, but don't starve your children to do it. Don't give too much. I bet that's a message you hear all the time in this church. Every time, I mean, most Sunday, he's got to remind you, please don't give too much this week. God's method is that we would give, but we should give with an attitude of joy and we should give an amount that doesn't endanger our own family's life. But here's the good news. We can give up to that point. I mean, you can give and you can give and you can give until giving a cent more. Giving, no, you don't call them cents. What do you call them here? They are still cents, but you got rid of your pennies. You got a five cent, what is, what is it called? A nickel. You stole our verbiage. So you can give until giving a nickel more or a minute. You still use minutes, right? You give a minute more 
You can give until giving a nickel or a minute more would be an actual threat to your life. But up to that point, you can give. Isn't that exciting? You're not with me, but we'll go to the next point. This is in 2 Corinthians, chapter, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 14, he says this about the offering too. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. Isn't it great that our lives are filled with manna? That God has rained down on us gifts we don't deserve. We were born into a society that has given us just more than we need. And so he says, you have the gift now of having surplus. You can take care of those who don't have enough. But just a humble reminder that someday you might be the one in need. There's so much about your surplus that you didn't really earn. It just showed up. And the reality is that tomorrow you could be the one without enough. And look, God will be good to supply surplus to someone else who can take care of you. And the last thing he says about this offering in 2 Corinthians 8, he says the goal of this offering, the goal of our giving is equality. Now, that's the second time he's used that word. It's a word that can be twisted, but he defines it for us. What kind of equality are we after here with this offering? The kind that was written about in Exodus 16. The one who gathered much because he had much family, didn't have too much. The one who gathered little because he had little family, didn't have too little, but everyone had as much as they needed. That's the equality God wants. Now, this isn't a quantitative word. It's a qualitative word. Quantitative would be, in other words, he's not saying, I want you to have the same quantity of money in your bank account, everybody. I want everybody to have the same quantity of square feet to live in, the same quantity of shoes and clothes. He's not saying you got to have all the same amount. He's saying, I want you to all have the same quality of life, which is that you just get to live. No one's starving to death, but everyone gets their daily bread. That's what God wants. Now, when we do this, when we are about God's mission, when we obey God's command, and when we are fully participating as God's method, we are sharing what we have through God's church for God's glory, incredible things happen. I'm gonna tell you a story about one of those. I was in Nairobi, Kenya in the Mathari slum, second largest slum in all of Africa. There are one million people there crammed into just three square miles of rusting corrugated metal. It was raining hard that day. My friend and I, we sloshed our way through the serpentine paths of the slum until we finally arrived at Elliot's house. Elliot, a dapper Kenyan young man, now he knew I was coming, so he put on his very best, his school uniform, seafoam green tie and gray sweater, met me out in front of his house, a tiny house smaller than the average North American bathroom, just six by eight, 48 square feet. That's his whole house. That tiny house just didn't add up with his big smile until he explained, my house is very small, but my God is very big. And he brought me in out of the rain and we sat on his bed and he began to tell me his life story. When he was five years old, his mother passed away, leaving his dad to care for him all by himself. Now his dad has the most common job on the planet. About 2 billion people do this job. He's a day laborer. Day laborers go out every day and they take any job they can for any wage that's offered and working his hardest every chance he could. He couldn't earn just $2 a day. And that's not enough money to put food on the table. There's no way to buy daily bread. So his dad starved himself, skipping meal after meal, day after day, just so his boy could have something to eat, a little rice, a few beans, on a good day, maybe a plantain. A little one who doesn't get proper nutrition, their immune system wears out, wears thin. Elliot was always sick with something, and there was no money to go see a doctor, no government program to kick in as a safety net to care for him. There was nothing. All he could do was hope and wait. Now, if you're born into what we call poverty here in the West, though, you at least have the hope of public school. I can't convince my kids back home in Nashville that school is a gift from God, but it really is. It's a gift that most of the world doesn't get for free. So in Kenya and in most of the developing world, somehow moms and dads have to buy books and a backpack and a uniform and shoes and meals and pay fees on top of that to take care of those teachers. It's not free. 
And how on earth can a father who can't even afford daily bread possibly afford to put books in a bag? It's a hopeless situation. Imagine that was you. And it's your children starving. What wouldn't you do to save their lives? But you can't afford to do anything about it. It's hopeless. Would you believe God is good? Oh, it's easy to believe that in Canada. But would you believe it there? In that kind of despair and darkness, could you believe that God even sees you? That God is good? Would you still trust him? Do you see why it's hard? But then a knock came at the door. And standing at the door that day was a pastor from a church right there inside the slum. And Elliot said, that preacher, he talked like a crazy person. I mean, he made the wildest promises. There's no way anyone could do the stuff he said he'd do. He promised Elliot he would not go to bed hungry anymore, that he could see a doctor when he got sick. He promised him he could go to school and learn to read and write and add and subtract and all the fees and the uniform, it would all be taken care of. He even told him that if he worked very hard and if he was, he was very bright, he could someday even maybe go on to university. You know, if he's not that bright or hardworking, you know, maybe he's a musician. He said, it's okay. It's a dig at me. They don't know. I'm a musician. So, yeah, right, okay. I can make a joke about us. But he said, look, even if college isn't for you, we're still going to teach you a skill that's going to change everything. I mean, you'll learn how to build things with your hands, work on computers, fix them even. But when you graduate from school, you'll have work. You'll give your children a better life than the one you've had. Poverty will end with you, he promised. That's not even the best promise he made. The best was last when he looked Elliot in the eyes and he said, God sees you and God loves you. God has a plan for your life. And that's the day that Elliot became one of Compassion's children. Compassion invented child sponsorship in 1952. They were the very first. And to this day, they're still the best or the highest rated child sponsorship organization of their kind in the world. What kind is that? It's the kind we just learned about. The kind that works exclusively and only through the local church so that God alone gets the glory. Compassion takes no government funding, but they're fully supported by Christians around the world who have more than enough who give to sponsor a child for $41 a month. And that $41 a month pays for the care that that child receives from a church in their neighborhood. And that church gives them five things, education and healthcare and proper nutrition, clean water to drink, but most importantly, a Bible and, a, and the opportunity to hear the gospel. Because of the work of compassion, on average 500 children every single day come to faith in Jesus Christ. Elliot has a sponsor named Nick. He showed me the letters Nick wrote where Nick would say, I love you, I'm praying for you, I'm proud of you, just little things that kept him going. And I wanted so badly for Nick to be there to see Elliot for himself. I wanted him to see that what he was doing was working, it was real, but I couldn't afford to bring Nick to Elliot. So I brought Elliot to Nick. Watch this. May I ask you a question? Yes. Can I do it directly? Yes, you may talk directly to like him. Now I'm talking to you and Nick. You may you may talk directly to Nick. Okay. Dear Nick, how are you? I hope you are fine. It's fine, it's a blessing to have you. And I can imagine how good you are to me. I love you very much and you are, you, are, you, are, you mean a whole thing to me. You are like my dad, you are like my mom. You give me hope and strength to be who I am. Thank you for all the things you've been doing for me and for the ones you continue doing. I pray to God to bless you, to give you hope, to encourage you, to also support others who are in need. That was, that was seven years ago. 
That was seven years ago, but just this past summer, I got to go back to Kenya, and I saw Elliot again. And a lot has changed. He now has a son of his own, three-year-old Jaden. Elliot did graduate from university, uh, studied business, and because Compassion teaches their children English, which is an international business language, he's now able to manage a cafe that caters to tourists and international travelers. He can take care of himself. In fact, he told me, he wanted me to know, Sean, Jaden doesn't need Compassion's help. Poverty ended with Elliot. God's mission is to show the world that he's good and trustworthy. They know he's good and trustworthy. They've tasted it. God's command is that we would remember the poor. And Nick remembered. He not just, didn't just remember with his money, that's the easy part, but he gave his prayers and his words and his encouragement. And he walked with this young man for 11 years of sponsorship. God's method is us, his church. So this morning, I'm asking you to consider a couple of things. First, if you don't currently give to your church, your time, your energy, and your resources, please start today. Start today. Maybe you didn't drop anything in the offering plate when it passed before. I bet your pastor will take it on the way out. I've never seen a preacher turn down an offering. He'll take it. So if you don't currently support the incredible work this church is doing, start today. Share your bread here first. But if you have more left over, share with your neighbors, with your community. And if you have even more left over, sponsor a child with compassion today. We have a table in the lobby. Stop by that table pick up a child sponsorship packet, fill it out and turn it in today. It is the best $41 a month you will ever spend because it will change eternity for a child. Let's say a quick prayer for us. God, we thank you for our daily bread. Through us, fill those who are empty. Thank you, God, for bodies that are whole. Through us, men, those who are broken. God, thank you for Christ and for the cross. Through us, preach that good news to the ends of the world. Is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on. Yeah, give it up. Amen. Well, it's great to have Sean with us to share a little bit about that. Um, it's good to be where we are, isn't it? Amazing to be reminded even, even about this corner of the planet that we get to live in. And this, this amazing space that we get, to, we get to call home and that most of us have gotten to have an education. And, and, if, and if we're honest, if we're base, basing it on kind of how the, how the early church saw it, most of us would say, oh, we're living in surplus. And so I don't know what it's going to look like for you to respond to this exactly, but we have a very easy, obvious, practical uh, way to respond in the lobby today. And uh, there's plenty of things we can do locally. Uh, the, the, a message like this is meant to inspire you and empower you to recognize that you are part of something that God is doing and you are, 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 are people who are blessed in such a way that, that others are meant to look at you and say, look how good your God is. Look how amazing your God is and look how trustworthy he is. I love how Sean said that. So today your response may look a number of things, but uh, a number of ways, but I would really encourage you. Go check out uh, the, the booth, the stand in, in the lobby. Go check out the Compassion Kids. We connected, uh, we got a lot of Thai uh, kids this time because we have a partnership already with missionaries in Thailand. Uh, we're sending teams there. And so potentially if you said, I want to sponsor a kid and maybe you end up on a mission trip in a few years to our partners, Imagine Thailand, Zach and Megan, and you end up getting to pop over and see your kid. Who knows? But one way or another, we just want to recognize we've got something great or something worth celebrating in our own lives. Our God is good. And there are a million ways to share that around the world, but this is one of them. And we really want to encourage you to step into it if you feel like you're able to. Let's pray one more time. Lord, thank you so much for what you're doing here with us. Help us to see who we are, God. 
We're people who, who for no good reason other than you are good, for no good reason other than you have grace, we are living in an incredible place. Lord, we all have, have incredible opportunities. We all are, 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 have landed somewhere that is good, Lord. And I just pray that those who, who around the world don't have some of what we have, that we would be considering them, would be inspired by our Jesus for them, God, and that we would live to make a difference in this world for God's glory. In Jesus' name we pray, and anyone who believes it says, amen. Why don't we stand on up? We're going to head out. The team's going to lead us out of here. But happy Mother's Day. We have a gift for you moms as you're heading out. Uh, but have an incredible day. Come on back next week. We're almost done this Send Me series. It's going to be good. I'm back preaching. We're going to have a good time. We love you. Have a great day.